But first, we return tonight to our ongoing look at the global fight against HIV AIDS. Produced in partnership with the Pulitzer Center, William Brangham begins a new five-part series, and he's here tonight. So, William, this is a follow-up to the series done in 2016. Tell us what's different about this one. That's right, Judy. Um, in the last project, we looked at places that were starting to turn the tide against HIV, places that gave researchers hope that ending AIDS actually might be possible. This year, we wanted to look at places where those challenges are still enormous. So producer Jason Kane and I, working again with John Cohen of Science Magazine, went to three very different locations, Russia, Nigeria, and Florida. These are places where the fight against HIV is not going so well. Tonight, we start in Russia, where some proven strategies to stop the spread of HIV are being ignored and shut down. Welcome to the last needle exchange program in the city of Kazan, Russia. What they do here is textbook HIV prevention, free clean needles for those who need them, HIV tests so people know if they're infected and can get treatment right away. For those who can't make it to the center, counselors like Marcel Zaropov will come to them. This father, Vyasheslav Ignatenko, shoots drugs several times a day. He's also HIV positive. Injection drug use has been the main driver of Russia's epidemic. In some cities today, a staggering 30 percent of people who inject drugs are also HIV positive. But because Ignatenko gets these regular visits, he's taking his HIV medication, his virus is suppressed, so he's likely not infecting anyone else. HIV is already too big of an epidemic, isn't it? And I want people who use drugs to have the things they need, needles and condoms, and for the disease not to spread. That's what I think about. These proven techniques help this city of 1.2 million keep a growing HIV epidemic largely at bay. New infections among people who inject drugs here dropped from 1,000 a year in 2001 to just 150 several years later. But these kinds of efforts are increasingly rare in Russia. The government passed a law in 2012 branding many groups that do this kind of work as foreign agents because they take donations from abroad. That's widely understood to mean spy or traitor. Many closed down as a result. Even this program is in jeopardy. There will be no money to pay for the services you visited today. Maybe it will survive for a couple of months, maybe two to three months, but then it will cease to exist. Larisa Badrieva is an epidemiologist who helps run these programs. Recently, the Russian government also stopped taking money from the Global Fund, which is the world's largest donor of government and private sector money into HIV-AIDS programs. And despite promises to the contrary, the Russian government has not filled the gap. Well, we've been waiting for a long time for this funding to stop. Honestly, we've done everything we could in this situation. But if there are no radical changes in the drug scene, we'll see a gradual increase in HIV infections in all groups. Russia now has the fastest growing HIV epidemic in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Over 80 percent of new infections in the region occur here. It's one of the few places in the world where the epidemic continues to get dramatically worse. Of the estimated one million Russians who are infected, only a third are getting antiretroviral treatment. I would say, in short, they did it all wrong. Michel Kazachkin was head of the Global Fund from 2007 to 2012. As Russia's economy grew, Russian officials told the fund they didn't need any more help. And they became defensive and, and said, OK, we will do things ourselves now, from now. So they said, first, we don't want the Global Fund anymore. We can manage ourselves. We will set up our own strategy, uh, and that's where they basically closed everything. Kazachkin is now the UN Secretary General's special envoy for HIV AIDS in the region. We visited a gay film festival with him in St. Petersburg. Gay and bisexual men are another key driver of HIV, and another population Kazachkin says Russia is ignoring. He says Russia's rejection of so many proven prevention strategies is partly why 20 to 30,000 people are dying of AIDS in Russia every year. I just cannot accept that there has been so many missed opportunities. 
until they really scale up. That will translate into many more new cases in the years to come and many more deaths. In some cases, even well-intentioned efforts can have the opposite effect. We traveled over 1,300 miles east to the city of Yekaterinburg, where one famous anti-drug campaign epitomized what many say is the exact wrong way to address HIV. I am one of the many who decided to revolt and rise up against the drug use in our country. Yevgeny Roisman is one of the most influential voices in this city. He's been mayor for five years. He just stepped down last month. And in the realm of Russian politics, Roisman would be considered a liberal. He's a vocal critic of Vladimir Putin, and he urged voters to boycott the last election. Despite his vast collection of religious iconography, Roisman has also pushed back against his country's religious and cultural conservatism. He very publicly took an HIV test to show how easy it is. But Roisman came to prominence in the early 2000s, running a vigilante-style anti-drug campaign called City Without Drugs. This ABC Australia documentary shows how it worked. Nighttime raids where men grabbed drug users and carted them off to other sites. There, they'd be handcuffed to beds as they went through withdrawal. Roisman says the city's drug crisis at the time called for a strong response. When we stopped the drug trade, the parents started bringing us many drug addicts, 30, 40, 50 people a day, on chains, on rope, in the trunk, half rotten. The moms and dads were weeping, down on their knees, begging, please, do whatever you want, just save them. This HIV-positive man who went through the program says he was chained to a bed, there was no counseling, he says he didn't tackle his addiction until long after he was released. Well, it might have helped some, but the majority at that time went backwards. Methadone and other opioid substitution therapies, like at this center in the U.S., are outlawed in Russia. The World Health Organization considers this proven addiction therapy an essential tool in the fight against HIV because it can stabilize a drug user's life move them away from injecting drugs, and also help them stay on HIV medication. But this woman, who also went through the program, said not only did they get questionable addiction treatment, but one staffer threatened to reveal people's HIV status. They would bring these doctors and take everybody's blood, and those who tested positive for HIV, they said they'd post it online, with photographs and last names. One of the public slogans of Roisman's program was drug addicts are bastards. And while lawsuits alleging kidnapping and torture eventually forced the program to close, Roisman stands by his approach and says he did nothing wrong. He says thousands got over their addictions, and he believes the critics have it backwards. The human rights activists, the abstract humanists, said, why are you talking like that about drug addicts and crooks? They are humans as well. They are people like you, but they are poor, unhappy, and sick. My job was to ensure that children do not use drugs, and their job was to see that those who use drugs were treated well by society. They're entirely different. Everywhere I've been in the world where people inject drugs, the culture has rejected that community. John Cohen has been covering HIV AIDS for over 25 years for Science Magazine, and he was our partner on this series. He says this harsh treatment of addiction, not seeing it as an illness, only fuels the spread of HIV. And the medical profession and the World Health Organization, the United Nations, has They've all concluded that it's an illness. That addiction is an illness. Addiction's an illness. Treat it like these are not vermin. They're humans. They need help. And if you adopt that philosophy, you can stop the virus. On the other hand, if you treat these as just bad people, throw them in the trash, you're fueling your epidemic. So what does addiction treatment look like elsewhere in Russia? Many are like this, small inpatient centers where patients go cold turkey and which follow something close to the 12-step model. Most government-funded programs offer a quick detox and then you're back out. 
Pristinsk. We've tried rehab programs. We've tried cold turkey programs, and they certainly don't work. Um, and so we need to do something to try and get ahead of the epidemic. Quite a large, numerically large. Vinay Saldana runs the UN AIDS office for Volga. Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and based in Moscow. In Russia, how different the epidemic looks. We've seen really since 2010 the epidemic in Russia getting significantly worse every year by almost 10 percent per year. And hopefully things are going to start getting better very, very quickly rather than continuing to get worse. But for now, Russia's prevention efforts seem sparse. In Moscow, these two volunteers from the small grassroots Andrei Rilkov Foundation are the only people out tonight dispensing free clean syringes this in a city of almost 12 million. This man asks for a bag to carry his needles home. Sorry, they say, no money for bags. So he puts them in his pocket. They warn him to be careful. It's all they can do. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham in Moscow. Tomorrow night, William reports again from Russia and looks at why critics say the government is failing to respond to the epidemic. You can see all of our reporting for this series, The End of AIDS, Far From Over, on our website, pbs.org newshour.